about the Battle of Jericho. And next week, uh, I've been debating what to do, but uh, we'll lead into it at the end because that, yeah, that'll be a fun one. So what, I, what my goal has been with the Nephilim and that sort of thing is to stick with Scripture. Uh, and because it's real easy to get off of that track. Uh, and so we'll do the same thing here today. Next week we'll have a little bit more fun with some things of staying with Scripture, but then asking why and having a little bit of fun when you look at stuff. So that'll be interesting. Uh, so we're doing the Battle of Jericho. Here's the four points on your outline. The historical setting, giants. How many of you guys have had a Sunday school class at Jericho when you were a kid or at some point, right? Well, you know, the walls came tumbling down. Whoever connected it with the Nephilim? I never did. I never heard that. But you can't understand Jericho without understanding Nephilim, uh, which is an interesting thing. Uh, then we're going to look at the fall of Jericho and then the test of faith. So we're going to start up here with the historical setting of the time of Jericho. So these guys, Salmon right there, Salmon, I don't know how you're supposed to say it, but he married Rahab. So he married Rahab. Who got that? You? Uh, good. I, heard, I heard a voice somewhere. He married Rahab, so that's where you put from Adam on down. That would be about the time of the conquest right in here. Uh, and there's an outline of the flood, the exodus, and then there was 400 years from when they uh, went into captivity uh, until you would have, uh, or 400 years they were in captivity, and then 40 years wandering the desert before Jericho, and then it took about six years to take the west side of the Jordan. So the east side with where Og and Sihon were, they got that with pretty quick. And then you have the, I just put places with big walls on them. Babylon was probably one of the biggest, most powerful military centers in the ancient world. Uh, and that's a very fascinating story of one of the queens that built the walls around there by diverting the Euphrates River and building the walls. But then hundreds of years later, that also led to their downfall when Cyrus the Great and the Medes and the Persians came, and they diverted the waters back into that same ancient lake, and that's how they got in with some fascinating prophecy that talks about that. And then the Battle of Troy uh, <clears throat> with Achilles, the greatest warrior ever born. Uh, we'll touch on him a little bit next week because there's some cool stuff with that. Uh, so where's, this is where we're at now, the Exodus to Jericho. And so where do we go? We're in the Middle East, so you got Egypt, then the Sinai Peninsula and the Levant, or this area here, the Promised Land. The Levant's just the eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean. There's the Mediterranean, that would be Israel and that area there. So this guy Moses shows up and he spreads the waters of the Red Sea and Israel escapes. We've talked about the plagues a little bit, but they escape, get into the desert area and they're coming into the Promised Land of Israel. And we get 12 spies. Who sent those 12 spies out? Moses. Moses did. So number one, Moses sent 12 spies to check out Jericho. Oh, ah, there we go, false. Uh, he, so I'm trying to be tricky there. He sent 12 spies not into Jericho, but in the bottom half. So we'll look at the maps. There's two different times, two different sets of spies. The 12 spies were sent by Moses into the area of Hebron and Jerusalem area. You had to get to Hebron to get to Jerusalem, we'll see on the map. Later on, Joshua sends two spies into Jericho. Two different times, two different spies. So here's the map. They came, the Israelites came from the Sinai and the desert coming up here, and they came to Hebron. So some of this will be reviewed, but at Hebron, who did they run into? <laughs> Nephilim, Anakim. In Hebron were Ahimon, Seshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak. Uh, so that's Hebron, so they're coming up here. In order to get to Jerusalem, you've got to go through Hebron going this way. So number two, the ten bad spies wilted when they came to Hebron. Why? Anakim were there. Giants. Nephilim. So the twelve spies, you had twelve, two were good, Joshua and Caleb. They understood the word of God, but the ten didn't believe that they could take the giants. And so because of the 10, they had to go wander 40 years in the desert. But when they went in, here's what they said. Well, the people are bigger and taller than we are. The cities are large and fortified up to heaven. These things are huge, big cities. This is not one of those. This is a, a monastery from about 500 AD. So this wouldn't be one that they went against. But look at the people there. Look at the fortified city. You could put whatever you want up here, you know, archers, you know, tar, whatever you're going to throw down there, catapults if you get them up in there. 
Uh, that's going to be pretty tough to beat, isn't it? What was the purpose of a moat? Slow them down. How do you push your siege works through a moat? You don't. Babylon had a massive moat with marshes around. There's no way you're taking siege works in the Babylon. Uh, that's a, so there's no moat here, but you can tell that's tough terrain to get your, if you're trying to bring catapults or something like that through there. But are they really worried about the size of the cities? What are they really looking at? The size of the people are bigger and taller than they are all. And besides, we saw the sons of Anak, the Anakim there. So what was it that really triggered the 10 spies? Were they just idiots? No. They were fools because they didn't see as God does. But from a human perspective, they're totally smart. There's no way. They're giants there. We can't beat those guys. So that's what they saw when they went up to Hebron. And the name for Hebron, the ancient name, was Kiriath Arba. Arba. Well, he was one of the Anakim. And so the people in the land are strong. This is the, the spies giving their bad report. And they say, uh-oh, we saw the descendants of Anak and Amorites. Both of those, Anakites and Amorites, are giants. We're not able to go up against the people. They're too strong for us. And the people are of great size. We saw the Nephilim. And then Moses inserts, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. We are like grasshoppers in their eyes. So this is the report of what they saw. What's one of the character traits that God hates? Pride. Yeah. Pride. He hates pride, but here's another one he hates. Whining, whining. Yeah. whining and complaining and Coward. cowards. Number three, God hates cowards. That's an interesting concept. Can't stand them. So the spies went in, they saw the land, and what was God's response? Do not be shocked. Several times talking about giants, the phrase, don't be shocked when you see them. Uh, and there's interesting extra biblical things that talk about that that we're not going to get into. But don't fear them and don't be shocked when you see them. So we're talking about the Nephilim. We saw the Nephilim. The sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. We became like grasshoppers in our sight and in theirs. So the Anakim are part of Nephilim. We see Arba was the father of Anak, so Anakin would come from him. That would probably be one of the originals. And of course, his kids would be big. Uh, Arba was the greatest man among the Anakin. So we have no idea how big or strong he was, but I'm sure it was pretty good. And the name of Hebron was Kiriath Arba, named after Arba. His descendants, the Anakin, lived there. Joshua and Caleb understood that it's not about what you see from a human perspective. They understood the protection is removed. And we covered that in the first talk on the Nephilim. Their protection has been removed from them. God is with us. And look at this. They will be our prey. So they knew they could go in and take it. They were referring back to God speaking to Abraham uh, when he said, I will give your descendants this land to possess. So that was promised. But you, Abraham, will die at an old age. You died at 175. Uh, and in the fourth generation, your descendants will return here because the sins, the iniquities of the Amorites is not yet complete. So God was actually protecting them, and by this time now, their sovereign protection was removed. Joshua and Caleb understood that. They knew that now we can go in because God will be with us. They have legal authority, and their protection is now removed. So even though they're giants, we can take them. And Moses chastises the children of Israel and says, but you were not willing to go up. When the command was given, you didn't go. You rebelled against the command and grumbled because the people were too big. So as a result, uh, they went into uh, wandering the desert. But Moses told them, don't be shocked or fear them. The Lord goes before you. He is going to fight just as he did in Egypt, the ten plagues, going through the sea, the pillar of fire, cloud. God is going to do this for us. Moses, Joshua, and Caleb were the only leadership people that got. So, did the children of Israel obey? No. They didn't obey, so they got kicked back down to wander the desert for 40 years. Uh, and so here's the map. They came in initially to Hebron, and then God said, go in. They said, no, they're too big. And then God chastised them, and then they said, oh, shoot, we should have. So they decided to go anyway. But they got whipped because God said, I'm not going to be with you now. You didn't go when I told you to. And so they got sent back down south. And then they went for 40 years back into the desert. 
After the 40 years, they come back. This time, they don't go up to Hebron. They go up here to Edomite, uh, to the descendants of Esau. And there's the Moabites from Lot and the Ammonites. So we've reviewed all those guys. They're not giants. But they, the Israel was told, you can't have any of their land. Were there any other inhabitants in the land besides those three? Yeah. There's all these dudes, right? Who are these guys? These are the Nephilim. All those are Nephilim, the Emim and the Zamzumim, the Amorites, the Rephaim, and the Anakim. And by geographic areas, they'll call them different names, but they're all Rephaim, they're all uh, Nephilim. Number four, the Promised Land was populated with a defensive network of Nephilim. Who would have known that the descendants of Abraham were coming back four generations later? Satan would have known that. And so he could get things prepared. Uh, and that's one of the things he's doing with the Nephilim. So now that we understand a little bit of giants being there, we're going to look at them just briefly again. And I've shown you this a few times. But it's always good to have this concept of who's who. Uh, and there could be others that may have been Nephilim, but these are the ones we know are. And so Anak, we saw Arba was the father of Anak. And Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. But the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim, so we can connect those. Then we have the Emim. The Emim lived there formerly as great, numerous, and tall, the height, as the Anakim. And like Anakim, Emim are also regarded as Rephaim. But in a different geographical area, the Moabites call them Emim instead of Anakim. So both of those are Rephaim. Then we have the Zamzumim. It is also land of Rephaim, because Rephaim lived there before they were exterminated. In a different geographical area, the Ammonites call them Zamzumin. But you see, they're like the Anakim, and they are Rephaim. So Zamzumin are also Rephaim. And because they're connected with the Nephilim, if you're a Rephaim or one of these, you are Nephilim. And so that's how you can understand when you're reading through. If you don't know the people and you show up somewhere, it doesn't make sense. But once you understand these connections, it all makes sense. Nephilim are Rephaim. And that's when you get in Isaiah and Psalms, and the Rephaim have no resurrection. And you start seeing how these parts piece together a little bit. So now we get to the history book of the world. And the Bible says some interesting things about the Nephilim. Genesis 6, we're not going to parse this like we did before. But the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also after. Sons of God, ben Elohim, direct creations of God, angels, is the only thing that word is ever used for, came into the daughters of men, ben Adam, not line of Seth, not line of Cain. You cannot get that from exegesis. It's only adding that into scripture that you get those lines. But it's general women is who these sons of God came into. That's how you got the Nephilim. But you notice that phrase, and also after. Genesis 6, before the flood or after the flood? That's before. Uh, and then Genesis 7, 8, 9 is the flood. So before and also after the flood. Well, who would have wrote that? Adam, Noah. Yeah, we got Adam who wrote the first part. But was Adam around at the flood? No, he wouldn't have been there at the flood. And remember the Tolly Dotes, the generation, and then specifically here, the Safer, the book of Adam. So we know Adam wrote... Uh, the part prior to Genesis 5.1. And these colophons, or what they're called, are signatures at the end of your account. So who would have wrote the account including Genesis 6.4 in the first part of Genesis 6? Noah. Noah. So let's look at Noah a little bit with the genealogy. He was 500 years old when his first son was born, uh, but he lived 600 years until the flood. So that <coughs> vertical red line is the flood. Did Noah live before the flood and after the flood? Yes, 350 years after the flood. In fact, Noah lived well in the life of Abraham. Shem outlives Abraham. So would Noah be in a position to write about Nephilim both before the flood and after the flood? Who wrote the account in Genesis 6? Who are we told wrote it? Noah. Okay. Then Moses compiles it. But now I see how this authorship thing works. Number five. Noah would have known about Nephilim both pre- and post-flood. Noah was the author of the first part of Genesis 6. So now we get back to our map. We're looking at where the uh, children of Israel are coming in here. And 
they come to Jericho. So they've come around, they beat these giants, and they're going to come across the Jordan River into Jericho. And if you notice, Deuteronomy 1 and 2 is the initial conquest. As we get up now to Deuteronomy 9, these verses are when they're going to cross the Jordan uh, later on, after they've killed Sihon and Og and those giants. Hero Israel, you're crossing over the Jordan. Now you're getting into the real heart of the promised land. To go into the dispossessed, wimpy gods. Nations greater and mightier than you. You can't beat them on your own. They got giants with great cities. A people great and tall, the sons of the Anakim, whom you know and whom you have heard it said. And you know what they said? What was it? What was what did everyone know about the Anakim? Who can stand before the sons of Anakim? So number six, it was common knowledge that Anakim were mighty warriors, as well as giants. Everyone knew that. Who can stand before the Anakim? But they're saying the Lord your God is the one who will destroy them. It doesn't have to be you. So now we have uh, the 12 spies was early. Ten of them had the bad report, and they had to have the 40 years. Joshua and Caleb gave the good report at the beginning, but they had to spend 40 years. So those 12 spies, all that generation died. That has nothing to do with crossing the Jordan. They're all dead except for Joshua and Caleb. So now we have the second batch of spies that go in, now in Deuteronomy 9. And they're going to cross the Jordan. So it goes from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea, and here's the Jordan River right there. You can see Jericho is going to be the first thing they come across. How about Joshua? What does the Bible tell us about his character traits and his leadership? Good, bad, and different? Good. Good. He had the spirit of wisdom. He would see things as God sees. Knowledge and wisdom are different spiritual gifts in the New Testament. Knowledge is having a lot of facts. Wisdom is understanding facts the way God sees them. Totally different spiritual gifts. Joshua was full of wisdom. So we get to Joshua chapter 2 and a new set of spies. I think Joshua learned everything has to be confirmed by two or three witnesses. That's why they don't send one, but he's sending two, and I'm sure he did a vetting process better than Moses did the first time around. So they sent two spies. What time of year was it when they crossed the Jordan? Jordan was flood stage. It was harvest. There's flax. They use that to make linen and that sort of thing. And what did Rahab the prostitute do with those two spies? Hid them up in a roof. What was she doing with the flax? Drying. Drying it out. Why? It was freshly harvested. Okay, so that's the time of year we're at, and that's what they're doing. Here you see Jericho. This is not an accurate set of walls. We'll see that later. But she lets them out because her house is on a wall through a rope on the north, and that's where you can go up to the mountains. That's where they went and hid. The men of Jericho went. They couldn't find them, and then they snuck back. But the north side, you can get up to the mountains the easiest, and that's most likely uh, where she was. How about the men of Jericho? Joshua is full of wisdom. The Israelites are coming in. What about the men of Jericho? What kind of warriors were they? Pretty good, but they had a problem. Terror. Uh, and so Rahab is talking to them before they lay down up on the roof underneath the flax. And she said to them, I know the Lord has given you the land, and the terror of you has fallen on us. All the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. Number seven, terror from the Lord moved ahead of the Israelites for the conquest. Terror. That'd be a great weapon if you could uh, manufacture that yourself, wouldn't it? Put that in front of you wherever you're going. Uh, why? Yeah, that's a big part. They'd already defeated some giants. Uh, but here we have... Uh, we have heard how the Lord, she's explaining this, we've heard how the Lord dried up the Red Sea, clear back in Egypt, and now you came out of Egypt, and what you did, aha, uh -huh. we know who those dudes are across the river, Sihon and Ah, these giants whom you utterly destroyed, genocide them. And so there's Sihon and Teshbon, Og was up there in Bashan. We heard what you did to these guys, and now you're coming over here to us, and we know we don't venture over there. We like the river. It's a nice protective mechanism, and we kind of just keep our peace. We've got our walled city, uh, but we don't mess with those guys. Uh, and here, when they were going up to Heshbon with Og, this day, God says, I will begin to put the dread and fear upon, or fear of you upon the peoples everywhere. That's when they killed Sihon. Uh, 
that's when God started to supernaturally send fear ahead, was on that day. Uh, so now we see after Sihon, they go up and they take Og, the battle of Idre, and we turned and went up the road to Bashan, and Og, king of Bashan, with all his people, came out to fight us there. And again, do not fear him. Don't fear him when you see him. And here's a very interesting phrase. For I have delivered him. Did the battle happen yet? God is talking about it. It's already so securely prophesied. This is a done deal. I have already delivered him. Nothing has even happened yet in the battle. God's tense of verbs there is very interesting. I've already delivered him into your hand. Why would they be afraid of Og? Big, biggest dude in the Bible that we have the mentions of. And so he would be the last of the Rephaim, so by geographic area, the Rephaim here, but there's other Amorites over here, there's other Anakim over here, there's other Rephaim over here, but this area was specifically called the area of Rephaim, so he was the last in that area. Uh, likely his brother, that's what the rabbinical tradition is, but we don't know, uh, and they kept his iron bedstead uh, there in Rabbah of the sons of Ammon. So he was the last of the Rephaim, and this iron bed, or maybe sarcophagus. Uh, so this is one from Egypt, uh, made not of iron. And that's one of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was not a giant. Uh, he was a giant in what he accomplished. But notice that's not this massive sarcophagus. Look at the guy standing here. The length of that is nowhere near 13 and a half feet long. So you could imagine having this trophy case 13 and a half feet, 6 feet wide. And uh, they probably charge a fee to look inside. That's the dude. And they kept it for however many years they kept it there. We don't know when it was destroyed or stolen or whatever. Uh, so the Lord God delivered Og, this big guy, king of Bashan. And I've mentioned his weight, uh, but he would have been about 1,000 pounds. I had that wrong. Uh, Gilgamesh uh, would have probably been 1,600 pounds if you used extra biblical sources. Uh, Og, though, at about 12 to 13 feet would be about 1,000 pounds when you calculate it out. Uh, Goliath would be about 650. Uh, so the Lord God delivered Og, this big dude, king of Bashan. We killed them all and took 60 cities, not a single survivor. So when did God promise these victories to the Israelites? Before, the Before they got there, way back here in the time of Abraham. And so we've talked about this before. We won't spend much time on it. But Chedor, or not a Jew or an Israelite guy, but he and a bunch of kings went with him, and they fought people. They fought Rephim, Zamzuman, Emim. And Amorites, well, who were, now that we know who those people are, oh, this king, they went and defeated a handful of giants. And then remember this amazing story of Abraham with a mere 318 men went and killed those kings. That's an amazing thing that the Bible just kind of cruises right over it. But remember, he then comes to Melchizedek, and you can't just invent an order of priesthood, but Hebrews then clarifies who Melchizedek was. That was Jesus Christ. And we'll see how he shows up here several times. The angel of the Lord went before the Israelites. Melchizedek showed up to Abraham before you had the conquest. And then there's going to be some interesting things with Joshua. But this is Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ, the order of priesthood that Jesus would then resume with the new law. After the Melchizedek thing, uh, you had a covenant with Abraham. And God's telling him, to your descendants, I've given this land. And who are some of the people in there? I will give your descendants, the Rephaim and the Amorites, among others. So number eight, God promised Abraham that his descendants would conquer the Rephaim, or Nephilim. And here we have at the beginning of the Exodus, or of the conquest, this angel of the Lord who will not pardon your sins. So an angel has no ability to choose if he pardons or not. That's Jesus Christ who goes before them into the land. And he tells them, don't take their worship practices. So now we get back to Jericho. So a lot of people forget Moses did the leadership coming up through here, taking Sihon and Og. He was not allowed to cross the Jordan, but he started the conquest uh, and went all the way up, beating these guys. Now they come, uh, and Ammonites and Amorites are two different people. Remember, sons of Ammon are the Ammonites, not giants. They're from Lot. The Amorites are giants. But Moses is leading here. They're going to come across to Jericho. Uh, and Rahab telling the spies, when we heard it, 
Well, see what that was a minute, but our hearts melted and no courage because terror from God was going into these people. When they heard it, what's it? What God had done to Sihon and Ah, when he started to put the fear of the Israelites into all the other people. And so even though Jericho was not giants, they're having supernatural fear from God. And so now we're in a position to enter across the river and go to Jericho. Uh, they're going to go across the Jordan River. And when it came about, when all the kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan to the west, east, west, so they've already conquered over here, now all these dudes over on the west, and that's Amorites, that's giants, who are behind here, and the kings of the Canaanites by the sea heard how the Lord had dried the Jordan, they crossed it at flood stage, and look at the supernatural fear kicking in beyond the Jordan to the west. So now that's where we're going. So we're going to look at the fall of Jericho. So who gave the battle plan to Joshua? God. Very interesting. The angel of the Lord appears. Joshua's here. They've crossed the Jordan. And in Joshua 5, uh, he comes across this dude with his sword drum. And so Joshua says, oh, are you for us or for our adversaries? What was the response of this dude, the angel of the Lord? Neither. Neither. That's a fascinating response. He says, no. Are you A or B? Are you for us or against us? No. What? <laughs> That's an either or question. How do you answer an either or question with no? Uh, I didn't ask if you like, uh, you know, ripe fruit, yes or no. Uh, this is an either or. And you answered no. I don't get it. Well, he answers no, and he tells Joshua the same thing that he told Moses, you are standing on holy ground. Remove your sandals. So Joshua does. And then Joshua bows down and worships him. When you read in Revelation and other, what do angels do when humans worship them? Oh, oh, oh I'm a servant too. What did this dude do? Accepted the worship. That's not an angel. He accepts the worship. And now we move on to Joshua 6. So Joshua 5 only goes up to verse 15. And remember, verses and chapters are arbitrarily added in there. It's the exact same conversation. And we see, that's Jehovah? Yes, the text tells us that is Jehovah. There's his songs number there. That's not an angel. They call him the angel Lord. Very definitively. Here, what is that? That's deity. That's Christ. That's Jehovah. Okay. So number 9. Joshua had an encounter with Jehovah, or a pre-incarnate Christ, getting instructions for Jericho. That's the dude that told him, here's what I want you to do. Same dude that showed up with Abraham. How did Abraham win with 318 dudes? He had this guy with him, telling him what to do. We're not given details of that like we are with Jericho. When did this occur, this meeting? They crossed the Jordan. Were the Israelites ceremonially clean? Had they been doing all the law? Have they satisfied the law while they were in the desert? No. What did they not do? Circumcised. Ah, they weren't circumcised. So for 40 years here in the desert, they didn't circumcise the men. But you're right, they weren't ceremonially pure. And this is the time of Passover that they crossed over. They cross over Passover. And Joshua, before this encounter with Christ, says, you know what? we got to fulfill the law. I'm the leader now. You notice how Moses had a problem with circumcision? Once earlier with his son, it almost cost him his life. His wife did it. And then they didn't circumcise in the desert. I don't know what it was with Moses and circumcision, but there's a hang-up there. Joshua now is in charge. Moses is dead. Other side of the river. Joshua says, we've got to fulfill the law. Line it up, men. Oh, ah. Here we go. Circumcision time. All right. So... After they have done that, Jesus now appears. He waits. Are you going to fulfill the law or are you going to do it on your own? Once they've fulfilled the law, he now appears. How about their food? What have they been eating the whole time? Manna. They crossed the flood stage Jordan, had Passover. After Passover, they ate produce of the land. That day, manna stopped. They had manna all the time. They're beating Og and those giants up. So what was the battle plan that Christ gave Joshua? Interesting things here. He gives them marching orders. You're going to march around once a day for six days. On the seventh day, you're going to go seven trips. So here's how it's going to work. And here's how you line up. You're going to have on the scene. 
That'd be about 500 BC. We're talking 1400 BC. No catapults yet. Uh, it was Alexander that first used catapults. He understood formations as critical, so he had, didn't just use them for sieging, he used them to disrupt his enemies' battle formations. He was brilliant. Uh, but they didn't have catapults yet, but they did have siege works. Were the sons of Israel aware that maybe if you're going to lay siege to something, you ought to use siege works? Do they know about them? Well, yes. In their law. Oh, here's how you make siege works. Clear back in Deuteronomy. Way before the conquest. Don't use fruit trees. Eat from that stuff while you're sieging. But take the other trees to make your siege works. Yeah, God's telling them how to do it. So they know about siege works. It's in the law of God. Number 10, an army laying siege to a city would typically employ siege works. And it's in the law prior to Jericho. But you notice Jesus specifically omits any reference to siege works. But we're going to lay siege to a walled city. I think I'd want some of those things you can push up there, put the deal down and run out. Nope. Well, that's not part of the battle, even though they knew about it. So we get to the fall of Jericho in Joshua 6. And here it is today. You can see that's the mound. It would take uh, you know, a half hour to an hour to walk just clear around it. But you've got to remember, dudes are going to be on the wall shooting out. So you're going to have a wider uh, berth around it. But there's areas that are excavated. You can see all these holes. This is probably one of the oldest cities, uh, that's what archaeologists say. It has an internal spring. So it has a water supply. You're not going to choke them off with water. Uh, they went after harvest. So they're going to have food. Uh, and as they look at this and dig down, they find areas of the wall. But there's a picture. It had two walls around it. A stone wall holding the dirt back because the city's up high. They put dirt in there. So a stone wall to retain the dirt and then a brick wall up on top of that. Here's part of the stone wall. That never fell. That's still there. You can go find it today. Uh, and that would be about 15 feet. So you can see the big stones. Uh, and this is where they've excavated down to get to it. It goes down to the basement bedrock. So they dug down there to put the wall on the rock, and then they built stones. And you can see that's pretty high. Here's the mud brick on top of that. So you have stone, about 15 feet, and then you have brick. So you can see the transit. The brick is all falling down. That's the part that's falling down. So you see the retaining wall there. That would be about 15 feet high of stone, holding back earth. And that gives them what? Elevated position. What do you always want when you have projectiles? Elevated position. You can always outshoot your opponent until they get a catapult that you don't have or something like that. Uh, now you have the brick wall that was on top of the stone retaining wall. And that would be 12 to 20 feet high, 6 feet thick. So now you see there's dudes down here. There's the stone wall that would be about 15 feet high. The brick on top of that, so you're going to be 25 to 35 feet high on your wall, probably about 30 to 35, and it's six feet wide. So you could walk around pretty easy. Have your archers up there. You have two rows of dudes, pretty easy on six feet. And have them rotating around, loading, firing, loading, firing. So they can know what they're doing defending their city. And there's the earth mounds that the stone is holding back, and then another wall of brick here. Those two brick walls are the ones that fell. The stone is holding back the earth. That did not fall. So here you see a dude down there. Here they've excavated down, and they have 15 feet of stone and then brick that's all fallen down. You can see how wide it is. There's a, a brick. That are, they're kind of all over the place, um, and there are hardly any of those are still in position. So here you have the retaining wall with the brick wall up there. Here's the verse, and the wall fell down flat, so the people went up in the city. Every man straight ahead, they took the city. So it's the brick wall that fell down. And now you see Kenyon, Kathleen Kenyon, uh, is one of the first ones to excavate this, but she did not think it would really correlate with scripture. Uh, another guy, Bryant Wood, that's where I'm getting a lot of this from. Uh, he's an archaeologist that went back and looked at that as well. Here you have the fallen brick from the wall up here, and you notice how that can make a ramp to go right up in. Oh, that's pretty fascinating. The wall fell down flat. Not the retaining wall, but the brick wall. And this phrase, fell down flat, what it really literally means is fell down below itself. So the translators never really knew what to say in the old, because this was in the 1900s, they released 18 to, late 18 to 1900, that they realized, oh, it did fall down below itself where it started. The Bible is literally true as told by an eyewitness. And then what do the people do? They don't go into the city, they go up into the city. 
Well, they're down here. They go up into the city. Oh, wow. Literally true. Number 11. The upper wall of Jericho fell down below itself. Our Bible, English Bible, just say flat. Uh, but that doesn't quite make sense of what, what's going on. So here you have Rahab's house. Remember, it's on the wall. Now you realize this isn't accurate. They should have stone for 15 feet and then brick. But she had a rope with the red cord, so they knew who not to kill. And amazingly, her house stayed up. Her wall never fell, but she was on the wall. So she, her house would share it with the wall. Now you can see a little better. The Israelites running around down here. Here you have stone retaining wall, and then a brick wall six feet wide with battlements in front, so you could stand there with your archers, two rows of them thick, pretty easy. And there's another row here, sloping up ground, another one. The rich dudes lived up here. This was the low rent district. Why do you say that? Well, it's on the outside. It's only got one wall. And these houses were made of one brick thick. These all had two or more. So cheaper houses. Where was Rahab, the prostitute? Low rent red light district out there. That's where she was. Uh, that's true. Uh, that's where it was. So here, the whole thing would have fallen. But this just shows you if one little breach here falls down uh, with the wall. You get a better picture over here, both upper and lower brick walls falling down. And you notice they have dudes up here. They're not really six feet thick, but that's a decently thick wall. But what would really happen to the archers? Yeah, they're done. They're toast. Because you have six feet, I'm sure they were too deep, but they're all falling down. So not only does your 15 to 20 foot wall fall, but you've got another 15 feet to go and a tumble of bricks. You're done. Big old mound pile of bricks and dudes falls down. What just happened to your perimeter defense? Gone. Gone. And that was your best, that's your thing. You know, you watch Troy, where their best soldiers go. They're the archers on the wall. You can't beat them. Well, you can this way. So the interesting things are grain, jars of grain. So normally in Palestine, you'll find maybe one or two jars in a whole day. Grain up next to pottery is the most common thing they find at Jericho. And when you think about it, what was grain used for? <coughs> Food. What else back then? Bricks. Cows? Good. It's a good thought. Who would feed money to their cows? Oh, yeah, grain was currency. Oh, grain was valuable. You don't just leave grain sitting around. That's why they hardly ever find it in archaeological digs. Why are they finding it in Jericho? This is strange. Abundance. Abundance, it's right after the harvest. They didn't have time to, they didn't have time to do anything with it. But if you take it over, are you just going to leave money and food sitting there? That's right. You take the precious metal. They don't find precious metal in there. Uh, Achan was the only guy that disobeyed the command, but they were told, no, you don't loot this place. It's the first one crossing the Jordan. The first. So we'll, we'll touch on that in a minute. Number 12. There are jars full of grain still at Jericho today. Pretty amazing. So when we think back, this was the flood stage of the Jordan, and it was harvest season, the spring harvest. Egyptian tactics, they wrote about it, so we know what their tactics were, and everyone, but anyone worth a hoot knows, well, if you're going to go siege a place, you go right before harvest. Let them do all the work, plow the ground, do the stuff, and oh, no, here come the whoever that's going to siege us. So they run into the town, and what does your army get? Food. And you're going to starve them out. But Jericho has a water supply. And they got food in there. That's not very good battle tactics. And think of this. It's going to take you at least a week of your day. Remember two Israelites went in and slaughtered a whole town of people three days after a circumcision as a, a grown male. So how well do you fight within a week of getting snipped? Not very good. And so think about it. You're kidding me. We just crossed the Jordan. We're going to go whip these guys. And they're harvesting their crops now as we speak. We're going to stand in line and do that? Shouldn't we at least do push-ups? Do some bad? We do, should do something worthwhile. Why? What on earth? That's buying time for them to finish their harvest, for crying out loud. It's ridiculous. And you notice what was the grain? It's burned. It's charred. There's all sorts of evidence of being burned. So there's three commands that Christ gives Joshua. Anything living, what do you do to it? 
kill it. And that, remember, they just celebrated Passover. What is Passover really doing? The first thing that opens the womb of man or animal is mine, says the Lord. Passover is in recognition of that. Uh, and so he spared their life with the blood. And so the firstborn, this is the first thing when they cross the Jordan. This is wholly dedicated to God. You're going to kill all of them. Metals go to the sanctuary. And then everything else gets burned. Yes, that would include grain, a valuable commodity. So here you have Kathleen Kenyon there. Uh, she's doing teaching uh, this. And here's what she said. Uh, the destruction was complete. Walls and floors were blackened or reddened by fire. Every room was filled with fallen bricks, timbers, household utensils. In most rooms, the fallen debris was heavily burned. But the collapse of the walls of the eastern room, that's just where she was, she was on the east, seems to have taken place before they were affected by fire. This wasn't launching fire in and causing it to collapse. This was it collapsed and then it was burned. Wow. Heavily burned, but not plundered. Fascinating. You don't find that in archaeology. So we look at things here, how scripture is confirmed with archaeology. Uh, the city was strongly fortified. The attack was after spring harvest. The inhabitants were unable to flee. Remember, the Bible tells us they were locked in because of fear. They didn't leave, and they had their food in the town, but they had a water supply. They're going to do all right, so they think. It was a short siege. It was a week. The wall fell down below itself. Now we understand what that means. The city was not plundered, and the city in grain was burned. Number 13, archaeological evidence supports the biblical account of Jericho. So how did the walls fall down? Uh, Trumpets. And what does the Bible tell us? Oh. Faith was a power that knocked down the walls. Yeah, the trumpets were playing. There was all sorts of stuff. But why did they do that? Because they had faith. They obeyed. Faith knocked down the walls of Jericho. So now we're going to get to a test of faith uh, for our last thing. Uh, so how did the walls fall? Of course, it was faith. What's a better question to ask than how? Why? Why is always the question to ask. When you read stuff in the Bible especially, ask why. So why is this such a good test of faith? It's horribly, it's horribly tactics. Crappy tactics, right? <laughs> These are stupid. So let's look at Jericho, and this is really stupid. It's crappy. There is no, but who is the guy giving the orders? Jesus, Jehovah. Oh. But they're stupid from our perspective. But let's just make a list of what's stupid here. Why on earth are we sieging after the harvest? And why are we thinking around to circumcise while they're crop harvesting crops? They have an internal water supply in Jericho. And we know about seeds works, but we're not supposed to use them? Huh. And you notice it's, what's interesting about God is there's things he'll say specifically don't do. But what's very important to understand things is what he just omits in statements. He omits any statement of seeds works, even though they know about it. High, strong walls. Vulnerable. What's a Sally in military terms? Not a little girl. Do you know what a Sally is? Is your name Sally? Oh, well, here, you can have one of those. Uh, so uh, a Sally is an attack from a fortified position. So we could be in the wall. And remember, they're in a long line. You're vulnerable to a Sally. What that means, open the gate, send out some dudes attack a section here, and then when they're rallying back, you go back in the wall, and you got your archers. That's a sally. So the Israelites are highly vulnerable to a sally attack. Why on earth are we burning the grain? We can eat it, or it's a valuable commodity for trade. We don't burn that stuff, but that's what we're commanded to do. And this stupid idea of circumcising, <laughs> wasting at least a week while they're preparing. I mean, that's dumb. We've already crossed the river. Let's go fight first and then circumcise. Jesus didn't even appear until they followed the law. So now we go to 14. From a military standpoint, the assault on Jericho was a stupid idea. But remember, who gave him the tactics? Jehovah, Christ himself. So there's all sorts of kind of dumb ideas that you can think about. Uh, and, you know, they're kind of interesting to look and see what they might be. But the, the question really is, other than OSHA issues, is are you acting stupid on your own? That's what most of us do. We act stupid on our own, or 
are we asked by God to do something that we think is stupid? How about give the first fruits of what you earn to God? No, that's stupid. i got to pay rent. Well, what do we do? Is it stupid from our perspective, or are we just dumb because we're dumb? Two different things of acting stupid. So let's look at other stupid ideas in Scripture that usually most of these are Jesus Christ asking people to do. I'll just show a couple. Lazarus died, and he was buried, and it's four days later, and Jesus shows up. And when you read the account there, Jesus purposely delayed before he went back there. And so he says, yeah, roll away the stone. What does sister say? It's going to stink. It's been four days. What are we? That's stupid. Well, he had a plan. Disciples are fishing. What were they? Fishermen. They've been out all night. They know how to fish. And Jesus has the gall to say, hey, dudes, it's been a long night. Just throw, throw it over on the other side. We've been on both sides of the boat, you idiot. We've been out here all night. We know how fish work. What is six or eight feet difference going to make with the net? This is stupid. What disciples do? Threw it in. They did it anyway. And then they got this big haul of fish. Are you going to obey even what you think is stupid? Peter in a boat, the storm. Fishermen aren't normally afraid of storms. They're afraid of this one. And what does Jesus tell them to do? Come to me. And Peter did for a period of time, walked on water. Uh, but Jesus told him to come to me. Naaman's leprosy in the Old Testament. They said, what was the cure for that? Go wash. Yeah, go wash in this dirty Jordan River uh, seven <laughs> times and you're going to be clean. Well, his guy's like, can I go chop somebody's head off or something? I'm a military man. I'm not going to that dirty, icky water. Well, that's it's up to you. But are you going to do something that looks stupid? Here's a very interesting one. There's a couple of different accounts of feeding people, uh, but 5,000 hungry people with Jesus walking around. What command did Jesus actually give the disciples here? You feed them. You feed them. Jesus says, you feed them. Who obeyed? Nobody said, gee, that's an interesting one. Jesus just picks it up and starts doing it then. But he actually gave a command, you feed them. That's stupid. They didn't understand it. Nobody started breaking the bread or the fish. But Jesus actually commanded them to. One of them would have been able to do it. Had they stepped out in obedience, they would have fed the 5,000 and said, Jesus, do it. Think about that. Abraham, yeah, your descendants are going to have everything. Uh, Ishmael, no, he doesn't count. It's going to be Isaac. He's now 13, but I want you to uh, stab him and burn him up. That's the promised inheritance. That's stupid. But he started to obey until God stopped him. Gideon, no, you've got way too many guys. You only need 300. That's the first battle of 300 before Leonidas. 300. you got way too many. Send them home. Those are all stupid ideas from a human perspective. But they're all the same. They're a great test of faith. 15. A stupid idea is a great way to test faith. And it's not you. It's not your knowledge or wisdom. We see in Samuel to obey is better than sacrifice. <clears throat> Who's in charge when you obey? Ain't you. Are you going to yield? Think about sacrifice for a minute. We kind of, it's kind of like uh, the sacrificial price that David had to pay to marry the daughter of Saul. You remember what that was? Give me 100 foreskins. Philistines. Well, that's the price. But a man of war is going to, hey, you bet. I can do that. I want to go, because if it's a sacrifice, I'm kind of doing something. Obedience, I'm not doing jack squat. I'm following what he's saying, right? To obey. That's why obey is better than sacrifice. It's not focused on you. It's focused on God. So who really understands that God is sovereign? He's on his throne. And you look back in the time of the conquest, it was Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. And that was it. Then after the 40 years, he got a couple other spies to understand what's going on, and the people are now following uh, Joshua better. Why would you test faith? Why does God do that? It's like a weight scale. Hop on there and see what it says. Uh, and so you see, he's going to measure and evaluate it. Who's the best NBA team now? Why would you play a football game? Why do you play the game? You see who wins. Yeah, we can talk about it all day. We can say, who's better, Steph Curry or Michael Jordan? We can argue about that all day till we're blue in the face. Blue in the face. How'd you figure it out? Throw them out there and let them go. Right? Uh, they're different generations, so you can't do it. But you got to have a fight. Why is nature like that? There's always an alpha dog. See who it is. They're going to sit and bite and horse around and all this stuff until they got to fight and figure out who the alpha is. 
That's how the world works. God wants to know, yeah, you can talk a tough game, but let's actually test it when you have to do something. So he wants to measure it. So there's a couple ways of looking at this. God is sovereign, and we have to have faith when we accept his sovereignty. It's great to look at things like the archaeology of Jericho or whatever, uh, but ultimately it's faith in what God says. Or we could have man, that's Darwin, uh, and we can say, let's use science in quotes. Let's have man tell us what truth is. I want proof. It might be archaeology, it might be whatever. That is never going to be the same thing as faith. Because once you have proof, you don't need faith anymore. You know. Once we understand how these walls of Jericho fell, that they didn't 500 years ago make the King James Bible, well, we could actually translate it better now that we know. But that doesn't require faith, does it? So what's the real issue? It's authority. Who is going to be the authority in our life? Is it some kind of man, which ultimately then is Satan? Or it's God. Those are the only two sources of authority in the universe. There's only two, God and Satan. And when we want humanism, we want self, what are we really under? Satan. There's only two. So Time Magazine, the bastion of conservative Christian thought, right? So here they are talking about uh, Brian Woods is the guy that has given a lot of this that I'm using. Other experts, so other archaeology guys find little fault with Woods' archaeology. It's very interesting. Kathleen Kenyon, the lady, when she excavated first, the first guy to go into Jericho is a guy named Garstang. He thought, boy, this just correlates with the Bible. Then comes Kathleen Kenyon. Oh, no, this isn't a totally wrong time frame. Guess what she used for the centerpiece of her reasoning and why it doesn't fit the scripture? Lack of evidence. Just like transitional fossils or whatever. Arguing from a position of lack. She had all this pottery, but she said this is the wrong time frame. Woods is an expert in pottery. And he went to, no, this actually correlates exactly with the time of the conflict. You notice how there's always arguments in intellectual circles of, oh, that was the wrong time, or you know, there's all this kind of stuff. She was arguing from a lack of evidence. Well, other experts in, in archaeology find little fault with Woods' archaeology. Yeah, he did a good job. What he did was correct, archaeologically correct. But what's the problem? Well, we'll see. But they're more skeptical about his linking of the evidence with biblical events. Because can the world ever have the Bible be true history? No. It cannot have that. But that's what scripture is, is real history. But Satan cannot have that. Can progressivism in political world today, can it teach true history? No. No. no it cannot. That's why you see all the changes and battles going on in our school system. It cannot teach true history, because then you understand good, evil, God, Satan. You understand the history of things, the Holocaust or whatever else you want to put in there. So what did God, did God really say that? That's what Satan said when he came down. And we teach, yeah, Joshua and Jericho, they marched around, the walls fell, but we don't ever understand. We don't teach our kids the real history, right? We just, yeah, the, you know, trumpets and walls, and I uh, really it was kind of a load of garbage anyway. It didn't happen, but we'll teach you the story, right? Just like Jonah and the whale. Ah, uh, that didn't really happen, but we'll teach us just so sort of. Suppose if we could scientifically prove every historical event in scripture. Let's say we could. We could use archaeology or whatever. If we could prove it all, what would happen? Um, with nothing. Yeah, nothing. Nothing. People would not, but still wouldn't accept it. What was that? Oh, that is the Reese's peanut butter cup. There would be no faith. So let's see what this means. By grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourself is a gift of God. If you scientifically prove something, what do you not need anymore? You don't need faith. If you don't have faith, well, how is it that we're saved? We're saved by grace through faith. It has to have faith to be saved. If there's no faith, then we earned it. Then it's not grace. And you start eliminating faith, you have no salvation, you have no grace. There is no gift to God because you know it. You know it. You're smart. Boy, you're great. Now look at the consequences. Who's left? It's you. All by yourself. Now, 16, without faith, there is no salvation. If there is no faith, then you must know. Where does that go back to? Ye shall be as God. You shall know. 
You see how that all correlates? You remove the faith and say, I want proof because I want to know that it's true. I don't want to trust and have faith that it's true. I think God sovereignly gives us all sorts of things that we can look at evidence that confirms it's true. Those are gifts from God. But that should bolster our faith, not make us look to prove everything that we think about. Because that's what Satan wants you to do. Because then you rely on yourself and not God. Does God ever ask you to have blind faith? He never does. You look at Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. Uh, God, you see two things. If you want to please God, you must A, know that he exists. So it must be the way he exists as he reveals himself in scripture. Number two, his character is good. He, he, he rewards those who eagerly seek him. There's no blind faith there. But what it's faith in is the character of God. There is never a point where God asks blind faith. He always asks you to trust in his revealed character. And once we understand that, then these stupid ideas aren't blind faith anymore. We understand who's asking us to do it. Totally different than evolutionary blind faith. Here's evolutionary blind faith. I believe that random mutations and natural selection can somehow create from nothing to everything, from no life to simple life to everything. You have to believe that a rock can generate life that can become more complex and information, a non-material entity, shows up by materialism. That is blind faith. And it goes against every scientific law that there is. This is moral. It's not scientific. Do we have faith in the character of God? So I think this teaches us a lot about leadership because leadership is really about obedience. How do we understand free will? We always focus from us, I, me. I like to have my own free will. That's crap leadership because it's focused on self. Real leadership is submission to God. Do we choose, what do we do with our free will? So let's look at Joshua. He an, has an encounter with Jesus, with Jehovah. He says, are you for us or not? He's wanting to know. You look pretty tough. I want you with us. No, that's not it at all. The real issue is, what are you going to do with your free will? God is. Do you submit to him or not? He does not go over to your side. He is unmovable. The question is, do you crawl underneath him and bow your knee? So Joshua bowed down in worship and says, what has my Lord to say to a servant? And then he obeyed. He employed free will in its proper form. I'm going to use my free will to worship God, be thankful, and obey, not celebrate a choice I can make. I'm going to submit. That's proper use of understanding free will and God's sovereignty, Calvinism, Arminianism. All these debates come down to what do you choose to do with your free will? This is a great example of it right here. So now they've come across, they beat giants, they've come across into Jericho. We're going to get into this area a little bit next week. And you see Gath is an interesting spot over there. And here's Gath right by Judah. And we're going to talk about some things next week that are fascinating as we kind of finish up giants and all that. But your uh, next week is going to be testosterone. Uh, and so we're going to have some battles. We're going to have people ripped apart. Uh, it's going to be a fun time. Uh, but uh, we're going to celebrate Father's Day. Uh, and how, uh, Mother's Day, I, you know, we kind of pass around some stuff and we look at flowers and things like that. But on Father's Day, we're going to have people ripped apart and we're going to understand Hebrew words and what certain guys did uh, that is cool and also helping eradicate Nephilim. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. Uh, in summary here, we looked at the historical setting of Jericho. The conquest really is all about God's sovereignty. Giants, you can't understand Jericho without understanding Og and Sihon and the fear of God going before the Israelites. That's why Jericho is all uh, hunkered in there. Uh, and when you're going to fight giants, you better obey. Do you have faith? The fall of Jericho is fascinating. The Bible gives us real history. And then a test of faith the more stupid the idea, the better the test of how much faith you actually have. Stupid from human perspective. So any questions on Jericho? Yeah, I was just curious, uh, were real people living with the giants as um, slaves or whatever? Sure. Well, oh, but they knew them yeah. because so we were in our sight and also theirs. So they interacted with them. What are you? 
But the giant doesn't care. You know, yeah, you're not, I, I might eat you, I might not. I don't know how many there were. Um, but several times it says they were as tall and numerous. So that's in there several times. So we know there were several, but we don't know how many. But when you think about it, this is the day, it's you and me, baby, and I've got a sword and I've got a shield and we're doing whatever we're doing. Oh, wow. 9, 12, 15, whatever you are, man, put three on your front line. You better have good slingstone dudes and good archers or you're in trouble. Uh, who knows how many they have. But the king could be giant. And so let's take the Horites, who the Ed Edomites took over. They may or not have been giants, but all you need is one, the king. They're the big dude. You know, you don't have to have the whole population be a giant. Any other questions? Well, let's pray. Oh. I'm wondering whether or not they've done in the archaeological discovery any digging into that pile of where you can see if there are remnants of armor and weapons and body parts in the rubble. I don't know. I don't know enough Maybe about it. Maybe they haven't really dug into it. Well, they've only, when you look at the pictures, they've just had sectors, you know, to do, and that takes a long time. So I don't know enough of what they found there. Potentially filling all the Sure. Uh, but they know they took the precious metal out, and so if you're going to go through the ruins, you know, it takes them several days to clean up after a battle, sometimes even longer. You're going to take the arrowheads and stuff like that, leave the wood, and the wood will decay. Right. But, you know, great question. I don't know the answer. Let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful day and, and uh, uh, for this time of year with the summer and the great weather uh, and uh, graduation season as people move on in life. Uh, and I pray that all of us will really strive to graduate in your eyes. Uh, in our study of the scripture, uh, in our desire to submit to you, even when we look foolish in the eyes of the world, because that's inevitably the way it'll be. In Jesus' name, amen.